What's up guys? Uh, this is Donald with emnursing.com. Uh, the website's actually not even up yet, but we are working on that um, to provide education for emergency medicine nurses. Uh, so we have had in our emergency department, which is kind of uh, what this video will somewhat be targeted to, um, we've had uh, a handful of patients present an SVT, which is weird because you know you feel like you can go six months and not have a single one and then you get two uh, two in a row. Um, so that's what we're gonna be talking about. What is SVT? Uh, SVT stands for supraventricular tachycardia. Think of the word supra as in above and then tachycardia is just fast heart rate. Um, so the conduction is starting above the ventricles. Um, it is a narrow complex regular, as opposed to irregular, a regular narrow complex tachycardia um, I'm not gonna go into detail on like how narrow as far as milliseconds and things like that. Um, how do we tell the difference between sinus tachycardia and supraventricular tachycardia? Um, so one of the biggest things is gonna be distinguishable P waves. SVT will not, there's always caveats to everything, 99% of the time will not have distinguishable P waves. They're usually hidden in the previous T wave because of just how fast the heart rate is going. Um, so, but don't get distracted by, uh, specifically by rate, because you can have a patient with a heart rate of 180, pressure 70 over 40, alter mental status, looks like crap, and guess what? They're in, uh, or they're, you know, they're septic, like they're actually not in, uh, in SVT, you know, because, you know, just print off a rhythm strip and diagnose from there. Also, another caveat that I, or not caveat, another kind of little pearl that I've heard recently is take 220 minus the person's age. So I'm 36 years old, 220 minus my age, carry the one. Either way, um, it is fine for me to be that number as my heart rate. When I mountain bike, my heart rates are right around 176, 178, 180. That does not mean that I'm in SVT. Now, if I'm 96 years old and my heart rate's 180, start thinking differently. Also, as always, we're thinking of the big picture, the big clinical picture on why is this patient presenting this way. Um, so SVT can present either hemodynamically stable or unstable. I've seen a heart rate of 200 with a blood pressure of 136 over 70. So, um, and whether the patient is stable or not makes all the difference as far as treatment. Uh, yeah, treatment. So how do we treat SVT? We're gonna treat either pharmaceutically or electricity, uh, like a, a number of heart rhythms. Um, <clears throat> either way, the patient's in the room on the stretcher. We're going to put the uh, defibrillating pads. Obviously, we're not defibrillating. We would be cardioverting. Uh, the defib pads on them um, hooked up to the monitor that's likely on your code cart. Most monitors in patients' rooms don't have the capabilities of, uh, of defibbing. Um, so if the patient is stable, we will be administering adenosine. The treatment uh, will be dosages of six milligrams, if that doesn't work, 12 milligrams, if that doesn't work, another 12 milligrams. There are, I've seen people do, or I mean, I've read, I've never seen this. I've, I've, I've seen or heard of physicians doing like 18, 36, 36. Either way, that would take like 50 vials of adenosine. Um, but so for the most part, you're gonna do six, 12, 12. Um, and if I'm not mistaken, the vials that we have in our ED are six milligrams in two milliliters. So um, just be keeping that in your mind as far as um, how, many, how many vials you need. Uh, so how do we give adenosine? We want to have as large as, large as possible an IV and as proximal to the heart as possible. If the best thing I got is a 22 in the hand, great. Um, I'd love a 20 in the AC. I'd love an 18 in the cephalic. You know, I, I put a lot of IVs really high up on like on my, uh, when I'm doing ultrasound. Um, so just the, the, the closer to the heart, the better. And I'll explain why in just a second. Um, so let's see here. Now we're going to hook up what's called a stopcock. It's this little device right here. It enables, enables, it allows you to hook up to the, uh, IV catheter. <clears throat> and then, uh, you can hook up two syringes to this stopcock. And then when this little word off, obviously this port is off. If I turn it, this port is off. So um, what I'm then able to do is uh, hook up my adenosine to one port and a flush to the other. Now we wanna give adenosine extremely fast and I'll explain in just a second. <clears throat> 
So um, before administering adenosine, we're going to hit print on the monitor so we can be printing a, a continuous rhythm strip. So as it's printing SVT, SVT, and then adenosine is given, and then we can watch it, knock on wood, convert or uh, decrease in rate down to sinus tachycardia. Um, so when the physician gives the order to, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, we've got our adenosine hooked to one side, our flush hooked to, uh, to the other. You're gonna have the flush off, so now it's a straight line from the adenosine to the IV catheter. <clears throat> You're gonna slam, and I mean rapidly push, faster than basically any other medication you've ever given. Uh, push it, turn it, push it <clears throat> as fast as you can. And why is because adenosine has uh, a very fast uh, or very short half-life. Half-life is a fancy way of saying uh, how long the drug has effect. Um, adenosine, I don't think there's any other medication that has any faster half-life. Adenosine lasts about three to four seconds. So I want to push that adenosine in and then flush it so it gets to the heart as absolutely fast as possible. Hence why 22 in the hand is just not the most ideal. Every drug has half-life. Uh, if you've ever heard like CRNA say, um, like succinylcholine knocks them down, vecuronium keeps them down, you know, sucks has a half-life of like seven to nine minutes, vec uh, has it uh, just significantly longer. Um, if the first dose does not work, like I said earlier, we're gonna be giving uh, a second dose of 12 and then a third dose of 12 if that second dose does not work. Um, when you administer it, uh, you are going to have a brief systolic pause. I've seen like literally up to like five or six seconds before. I mean, to the point where you're kind of like stretching out, getting ready to do CPR. Um, I describe it to patients as, you know, when your computer has like a weird error and you have to like reboot it, it's kind of what we're doing to your heart. Um, where you're, we're chemically rebooting your heart, so to speak. So if the patient is hemodynamically unstable, how do we treat that? This is going to be evident by hypotension or ultimate or altered mental status, likely the combination of the two. <clears throat> We're going to be treating the patient with electricity, not medication. Uh, so with the, um, with the pads attached, you're going to increase the joule setting of the monitor to 50 joules for your initial synchronized cardioverting dose joule setting. Um, you will hit the sync button. That's very important. Why? Because we are not uh, defibrillating, we are synchronized cardioverting. It's very important. Um, so when the physician says to, you hit charge, you say a Hail Mary, and then you cardiovert the patient. Remember, anytime we're shocking a patient, uh, atrium policy is I'm clear, you're clear, oxygen is clear. You gotta clear oxygen. You blow up one operating room, then you gotta change your whole policy. So we don't want to uh, um, send electricity when oxygen, like a, a bag valve mask is up across someone's chest, things like that. So anyways, I'm clear, you're clear, oxygen's clear, and then we hit the shock button. If the uh, first cardioverting, if the first cardioversion does not work, we will increase to 100 joules from 50, and then the third will be 150 joules. Obviously, all these can be overridden by whatever physician is in the room. Um, I spoke to one of our docs the other day, and he said he, he rarely, uh, ever does 50 joules, he just, cause he's like, I don't like sh uh, shocking patients that are awake. So if I have to do it, let's just do it once. So let's start at hundred joules and see, you know, see if we can convert them that way. Um, you don't have to hit the print button because maybe you do. A lot of monitors will automatically print when you shock. Um, it'll kind of print like a couple seconds before you hit the shock button. Um, and then it'll continue printing uh, for five, 10, 20 seconds, whatever afterwards. So that's how we treat adenosine. Some pearls uh, to remember. Adenosine is kept in the, um, this is for like my emergency department that I work in. It's kept in the Omnicell and also the top drawer of the code cart. Um, when you, wherever you get it from, grab six vials. This will allow you to drop one dose of six, one dose of 12, another dose of 12, and then you've got a spare vial because I always lose one vial. It just, I don't know where it goes. Um, when cardioverting, try to administer a little bump of street slang, of fentanyl and Versed. People that have been cardioverted describe it, I mean, and for whatever reason, it seems like everybody describes it this way as uh, getting kicked in the chest by a horse. I mean, it'll, it'll 
pick you up off the ground. I cardioverted a I think two week old, like four kilogram, and I swear like the patient's body came up off the mattress. I mean, it is, it is, and obviously that was one or two joules per kilogram, so, but either way. Um, let's see here, the best way and arguably the only way that you should be diagnosing a rhythm is to, uh, is to print off a strip. Uh, this doesn't necessarily have to be a 12 lead EKG. It can be just a rhythm strip from the monitor. Um, but remember, uh, kind of one other pearl, adenosine can be used as a treating medication. I don't think that's the best way to describe it. Or a uh, diagnosing. So if we think that this patient's actually an AFib RVR with rapid ventricular response, we are gonna slam that adenosine to slow down the rate. And then as we slow it down, we then can see, oh, this is actually irregularly irregular. They're in um, AFib, not SVT, but when their heart rate's that fast, you can't really see that it's irregularly irregular. Does that make sense? Um, let's see here. If the patient has a known history of SVT, some patients will say, adenosine makes me feel like I'm about to see old St. Peter and St. Gabriel. Um, so I do not like it. If that's the case, they, uh, you know, there could be a conversation between the phys physician and the patient on whether to administer diltiazem um, instead. Uh, so yeah, that's SVT. And if you have any questions, leave it in the comments below.